Folks, welcome to another prospect interview here on the No Ceilings YouTube channel. I'm Maxwell Baumbach, and today I am joined by Liam Robbins, who played most recently at Vanderbilt. He had a gigantic breakout during SEC play in which he posted 18.1 points per game, 7.8 rebounds, 3.5 blocks per game. And during that stretch, he shot 48.9% from the field, 50% from uh, three, and over 72% from the free throw line. Um, one of the more interesting prospects that I think kind of slid under the radar until more recently. Uh, we're really excited to have him here today. Liam, how are you doing? Uh, I'm doing good. Appreciate you having me on. Absolutely. We're, we're glad to have you here. So I always like to start at the very beginning. Uh, so when you were kind of growing up, what got you into the game of basketball? Uh, so I, I, bas my, I come from a basketball family, right? So, okay. you know, my, my parents are big sports fans, but I, I had a I had a basketball in my hand since the age of three. Like ever since mm -hmm. I can remember, I just love basketball. Well, I have, I have two uncles who uh, both coach at the Division One level. One's a assistant at Tulsa, and one's the head coach at the Citadel, uh, which mm -hmm. is a school in the SoCon. And I also yep. have a, another uncle who's a play by play announcer for the Toronto Raptors. So obviously, I have a, I have a lot of basketball in my family, right? Mm -hmm. But it was just something that I always loved without even knowing all that, right? Before yeah, even yeah. Knowing that I loved it. So it's very, you know, very fortunate for me, you know, I can, you know, thank God for placing me in a family that, you know, really appreciates basketball. So that's kind of how I got mm -hmm. started in it. And just my love obviously just got nurtured and grew for it as I got to learn more from my uncles, even my, you know, my mom and dad who know a lot about the game, just mm -hmm. learning about it. And just it's something I always want to continue to do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're going to get to continue to do it, which is yeah. a, it's a great thing. Yeah. You're in a, you're in a good spot to be able to do that. Um, were there any like players that you really gravitated towards like growing up Were there guys or teams or anybody that you're like, Oh man, like that's, that's my guy. That's who I want to take from or. Yeah. So, so it's kind of changed throughout the years, right? Like, so mm -hmm. I, I never, uh, you know, my dream was always to play in the NBA. So I yeah. never, I never cheered for a team, right? Like I, yeah, I, yeah. I, was, I was born in Wisconsin. So I grew up a massive Packers fan. You know, I like the Brewers, but I never had a NBA team. So I was like, well, I want, I want to play there. Right. So like mm -hmm. I'd watch all these teams. Right. And so like, you know, when, when I was growing up, I, I remember I, I would uh, I was a big Wisconsin Badger fan at the time, right? Okay. So I, I would watch uh, John Luer. He was the first mm -hmm. guy I really yep. watched, and mm -hmm. he was that he was kind of that first big you saw do pick and pop three, mm -hmm. on stuff like that. I loved how he played, and then obviously Frank Kaminsky came after him. Yes, yeah, yeah. And so, and Frank Kaminsky was a stud, but uh, in, in the pros, I remember always loving uh, watching Dwight Howard. Mm -hmm. And so like, he, he was just fun. It was, it was kind of something where you're like, I don't know if I could do that. Like how dominant he was. <laughs> yeah. Kid, yeah. You know, like, like I think people forget on the magic, how every game it was monster. just, he was yeah. a monster. It was, mm -hmm. it was impressive to watch. And then, you know, my, my dad uh, would cheer for the bucks. So Brandon Jennings at the time was like this, just stud flashy mm -hmm. point guard. So I'd watch him a lot. So I was really kind of more just a hoops junkie. There was just a bunch of different random yeah. players that I feel like people forgot about. Monte Ellis, too, when he got traded mm -hmm. to the Bucks, which yep. obviously came a big storyline later when you find out about all the Steph Curry stuff and everything mm -hmm. that went down. So I, I don't know if there was really a big man because, you know, I was taller for my age, but I wasn't, you know, massive where I didn't think I was going to be seven foot. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so, so I, I kind of just watched everyone and just like, really just enjoyed the game. But I, I would say like, as far as influence in my game, I'd say like Frank Kaminsky and John Lewis, just cause I mm -hmm. watched so much college basketball. Yeah. I'd say those two had the biggest influence. It's, it's funny that you mentioned them because, uh, so I'm, I'm 32. So I'm, I'm a little bit older. And okay. when I was in college, I went to a school in the Chicagoland area, ton of people from Wisconsin that like lived yeah. on my floor at college, all bucks fans. Like I, we were the yeah. biggest John Lure believers on planet earth. And then yeah, uh, absolutely, yeah. one of my Frank Kaminsky is, is from around where I live and he, he went to high school with my cousin and they actually had lockers next to each other. So it was done like oh, wow. alphabetically yeah. and based on their lockers. So yeah, yeah. Kaminsky and yeah. Lure guys, guys I know well. And, and yeah, you can see yeah. a little bit of them in your game as far as like the jump yeah. shooting and, and some of that stuff. Um, so I, I want to touch on like, let's, let's get into kind of the nitty gritty, of your game and things like that. Just to, mm -hmm. to start big picture for people who've never seen you play before. How would you describe your, your style of play? Uh, my style of play, I, I like to call myself a versatile big. Um, I, I shoot the three pretty well. Um, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say I'm, you know, taking the ball up to court like Jokic and stuff like that, but I'm mm -hmm. mobile. I, I, I can play through, you know, zoom actions and stuff like that. And I, I can make, you know, a good pass down. I can feed the post myself, anything like that. And then on defense, uh, I think I'm, I'm really good as I describe myself as an anchor. 
down mm-hmm. low, right? So yep. I, I block a lot of shots. I think I'm going to deflect a lot of, you know, passes that come through there. I'm, a, I'm, you know, as many shots as I block, I like to think I deter more from being taken, right? Like, like I feel like if you were to watch a game, you'd see a lot of guards, you know, they drive in, but then they would just kind of circle out or wheel out because they're like, okay, like I'm not even going to go in there. Or if they do mm-hmm. take the shot, I might not block it, but I altered it a good amount. So I think that's where, you know, you see a lot of my strength in my game and stuff, mm-hmm. is especially on the defensive end. Yeah, so I'm I'm actually going to kind of throw in a question I mm-hmm. didn't really anticipate asking, but I wanted to ask because I thought I thought you did a really good job of sort of explaining what you do on the defensive end, um, and you mentioned like getting deflections and things like that. I feel like you have kind of sneaky good hands defensively for mm-hmm. a big man. How did you kind of develop that? Because I think a lot of people um, you you did play like in drop coverage quite a bit, um, yeah. but when you were kind of playing like higher up, I was always really impressed by how well you did as far as just like using your hands to like get in on a handle or if someone tries to like sneak it a bounce pass past you and things like that. Um, how did you sort of develop those instincts? Cause I think like having, having good hands to like get in low is not something you see in a lot of big men. Yeah. So I, I think, I think it kind of comes a com- combination from all the different schools I was at. So like a okay. lot of people don't, so I started at Drake, right. And like when, mm. when we were at Drake, we would, you know, I feel like anyone who's played basketball, there's the, you know, people call it different things, but it's like the full court, um shuttle drill right where you're guarding yeah. someone and you know they have the ball and you're just there and you're you're kind of almost like dummy d but you're going back mm-hmm. and forth well they, they would make uh make us do it with a towel like this right so we would be okay. holding a towel when we did it so you kind of had to keep your hands up right and mm-hmm. it taught you not to not to foul like not to reach in but like mm-hmm. that so like i feel like that was big for me, like me kind of get my hands up and then uh, i think um, obviously at Minnesota, I picked up things and stuff like that, playing in the Big Ten, just learning from other guys who had sneaky hands. But I, I think a lot of it came uh, when I got to Vanderbilt, uh, Coach Stackhouse and staff, like we do a ton of defensive drills, just repping different like actions, like swimming over and, and doing other things that, you know, make you be really active with your hands. And so then when you get into games, all of a sudden you're kind of on instinct, just reaching your hand out here or doing this and you find yourself um, – D- deflecting a lot of basketballs you know he, yeah he, he joked that we were like i think if you were to look at the analytics like we're one of like mm-hmm. the worst teams in getting steals but we would get like 20 deflections a game we were, yeah. we were like the, yeah we were like the, we we're the team of like almost steals is what he said <laughs> okay and, and, yeah and so it was, like, it was like you know we could never get our hand on it but like so i i think a lot of it com- credit goes to you know vanderbilt and you know, obviously my other coaches just kind of teaching me to be like be really fundamentally sound and when you do that your hands kind of just gravitate towards the ball a little bit if that makes mm-hmm. sense for sure for sure so yeah yeah so let's get into to your kind of your big leap that happened um obviously like you mentioned like you're an, a real anchor defensively mm-hmm. is i think a great way to put it um so you were sec defensive player of the year this year you blocked 3.2 shots per game your block rate was 14.4 which is absurd if you're not like a person who looks at block percentages that's a really yeah. good number for a mm-hmm. nba prospect um and you've always done a good job of blocking shots, but this year it felt like this was like the most complete and dominant you were as far mm-hmm. as like shot blocking and deterring people from even kind of coming into the paint and things like that. What adjustments do you feel like you made that led to that result this season? Cause you, you always had like good shot blocking numbers, but yeah. this year was like really like kind of eye popping stuff. Yeah. So I, I think it's interesting. Cause you know, I always blocked a lot of shots. Like even when I was at Drake, I, I actually had more blocks that year than I did this year, you know, and granted, I played more games and, and all that, but they, uh, I, I think this year it came to a combination of two things. First off, like we have, you know, lo- low man coverage, right? So like, you know, our rotations were always, I'm rotating to basically stop the baseline drivers or mm-hmm. stepping up to stop the, you know, if they're driving down the gut, right. I'm stepping up and someone's covering for my guy. So because of like how our coaches would scheme things, it was almost kind of like they were funneling guys to me. Right. Mm-hmm. So our coaches, they were, uh, you know, a great job kind of um, emphasizing that or like, I guess like making a point to let me go block shots. Right. And, and, and because of that, I wasn't uh, in, in the past years, I'd be kind of out of position, try, kind of swiping at the ball. Right. And when you do that, mm-hmm. you're more prone to foul. So I, I think part of it was, yeah. I was, going after the right shots i wasn't chasing blocks i was just letting them come to me and a lot of that had to do with our defensive scheme so i give a lot of credit to our coaches and then also i think just getting older and realizing that okay there's sometimes where the guy has it he's gonna he's gonna get the dunk or whatever and stuff that you kind of have to it sounds bad but live to fight another day and so i think that led to me getting more blocks because now i'm not in foul trouble as much 
and then I can be aggressive down the stretch too when we really need me to be. So uh, yeah. I think it's a combination of that. I, I was going to say that was something that I thought was pretty interesting too, is that for somebody who has the block rate that you do, you fouled like not very often, especially like even yeah. like on a per 40 per 100 possession basis. Mm -hmm. Do you think part of that too is just like growing more like mature as a player too, or, or, do, or is it mostly like schematic or is part of it also just like knowing what you can and can't get to and knowing how to, how to have more poise. I, I think poise is like the word, you know, that best describes it, right? It's because I, I remember like, when, when, specifically when I was a, like a freshman sophomore, like I was going after everything, right? Because like your you, your your pride tells you like no one should ever score on me, right? Like especially when you're seven, yeah, but yeah. you're like no no one should get this layup on me and stuff like that, which is great mentality to have, and I still have that mentality. But understanding, okay, the guard dumped that off pretty good on B. Don't swipe down, and now the guy gets an and one, and that's a massive momentum play, right? You kind of have to think yeah, of the big yeah. picture. Because it's mm -hmm. not only did I just get a foul, they got an and one, you know, now the ref's looking at you to, you know, possibly be out of control or just be yeah wild, if you will. So mm -hmm. I, I think it's a combination of just kind of growing up in, in college basketball and understanding like, yeah, mm -hmm. you're not going to block every shot, but you're going to still get a good amount of them. You just have to choose your, choose your spots. Yeah. I, I think that's a great way to put it too, because like I've, had the pleasure of talking with like a couple big men now. And I feel like for guys that are in your position too, and their position as well, it's like when you were one of the best players on your college team too, it's like even more important that you avoid like picking up that unnecessary foul. Like it's so yeah. paramount. And I think that's something that a lot of young bigs have a hard time dealing mm -hmm. with and struggling with is they want to chase that block. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, cause it's a huge momentum play. Like, cause like uh, the way I, like I always would say that like getting a block shot was my favorite statistic. Like I'm not a stats mm -hmm. guy, but like, if you look at what a block does, like most of the time when you block a shot, it goes to someone on your team, right? Like, yeah. So not only are you making, you're guaranteeing a missed shot, you might be going on the break, mm -hmm. which can lead to momentum, which is an e maybe an easy bucket. So it really could be almost a five point swing. Cause let's say you get out and transition your wings run, run to the corners your your point guard hits it ahead someone hits mm -hmm. a three okay instead of them getting a layup and us taking the ball out of bounds we just got a wide open three made it and they mm -hmm. missed that layup because i so i always thought like it's a big momentum play so like big guys you know don't always get all the praise and stuff like that like because the game sometimes isn't pretty obviously you got mm -hmm. Jokic and Embiid and those guys who make it really pretty but like getting that shot's like kind of a big like yeah i did something good and so i think that's where the maturity comes in is like People mm -hmm. who know the game know what you're doing, even if you're not getting the block shot. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's like a lot less fun for, for people in, on the outside and in my shoes mm -hmm. to, to evaluate big men. And I think a lot of people talk about a lot of bigs as if they're the same player. Like there's, Oh yeah. yeah. He, he like, he block shots, he rebounds, he like mm -hmm. he rim runs, he does that. And it's like, well, like there's so much nitty gritty and nuance that goes into it. And you have to really kind of like sit down and, and pay attention mm -hmm. throughout an entire game to see like, what is the difference between this big man and that one? Because those those little plays where it is, you know, the the good block shot or the and one that you see because you wanted to to try and make a play that you weren't really in, it, it's a it's a huge huge difference. It just yeah it requires a lot of work. Yeah. yeah. Um, so one one thing I want to bring up is because I think everyone is is interested in scheme versatility now. Um, mm -hmm. And and at Vanderbilt, you did play in a drop most often. Mm -hmm. Um, yep. how do you feel with like different ball scheme coverages? Like, do you feel like you're comfortable playing in different types of schemes and things like that? Cause that's when you were in most often you did other stuff, obviously it's that's at that's modern basketball in general, but how yeah. do you feel as far as like being able to display different box ball, ball screen coverages? Uh, I feel really comfortable. You know, when I was at Drake in Minnesota, we, we were mainly in drop coverage, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, at, at Drake, we played pack line defense. So you're, you're basically always in a drop, right? Yep. Uh, Minnesota, sometimes we, you know, we, we would ice the guy is what you call it, where you, you know, you're trapped on the mm -hmm. outside. But um, at Vanderbilt, you know, Coach Stackhouse, obviously he's a pro guy, right? Like, yeah. We yeah. are pro staff. So the whole summer, we, we don't just train drop coverage. We train, uh, I, uh, we call it bluing, right? So that's, you mm -hmm. know, trapping on the outside. Uh, we'd practice uh, hard shows up to mm -hmm. the level. So like, yep. I was very comfortable doing all those things. Like, obviously, I think drop, you know, I, obviously physically is probably the least exhausting, right? It's still, it's mm -hmm. not easy. You have to do it right. But like, so yeah, we yeah. did that a lot. And especially with me being a shot blocker, I liked that one because it kind of gave me more opportunities to either deflect a pass or do something. But I mean, you, you could go through some of the film, like 
against NC State, you know, um, we, we trapped we trapped a little bit outside. There's a few other games um, where we're uh, Arkansas, right? Like mm-hmm. the start of the second half, uh, Anthony Black, you know, he was coming off a screen and uh, we we actually hit it. We we blew it, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, we, we me and uh, I think Tyron Lawrence was the other guard. We both deflected the pass. He went to back, but we stayed in it, right? We didn't retreat yep. out of it. We stayed mm-hmm. in it, and we ended up getting a fast break layup out of it because we deflected the mm-hmm. ball again. Tyron, Tyron got a layup, I think. Mm-hmm. And so, like, I, I, you know, I'm comfortable doing that. Obviously, you know, there's ways I can improve. You know, I can get better on my feet because, you know, th- the one tricky thing with those is, you know, if they get you on your hip too early, it's an automatic foul. Yeah, it's tough. So it's kind of risky. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, you, even – um. At Auburn, like I got, I got burned on one when I showed, and you know there was a little miscommunication. But like one of the times, I jumped out and I just tied the guy up for a jump ball on a hard show. Like I, I feel very comfortable mm-hmm. doing those, and like if the coach were to tell me, I know exactly what I need to do, and I understand the rotations. And you know, that's kind of why. You know, one of the reasons I came to Vanderbilt was to learn from Coach Stackhouse and learn how all these different ball screen coverages work because I never know what I might be asked to do. So for sure. And I think one thing that, that you do well, and I kind of want you to just talk about the importance of this as a big, is I feel like you do a good job of staying big when you play in those mm-hmm. different coverages. I feel like you do a good job of like arms out, arms up, stretch, so that it's like even if even if you are in a situation where um, you have to recover and things like that, you're you're playing long enough that you're still in the game for deflections. There still aren't easy passing lanes and things like that. So mm-hmm. could you talk about just like? how how you handle that and knowing you know what to do with your arms and how to stay big when when you are like showing or, or hedging yeah so, so it's a tricky deal right because like you want to stay big but you don't you don't want to be too big to where you're getting awkward or out, out of place right yes. and, and, mm-hmm. and so like, i think again like i'm gonna credit our coaching staff here at vanderbilt a lot like you know they'd always say you know be seven foot right like like keep your arms out wide and stuff like that just don't Cause like, it's like, they say never like reach down. Right. Cause as soon as yeah, you yeah, reach yeah. down that that's an automatic, that's an easy foul call for the rest. Mm-hmm. So like a lot of it was just discipline through practice, keeping my arms out or keeping them straight up because that's going to make it difficult. Like whether it's passing around or going over and then also just like keeping a wider stance. Right. Cause it, it, it's weird. You know, you talk about, you know, playing bigger. Well, th- they really worked with me, you know, uh, coach Curry or, you know, our big man coach and stuff like that he, he would have us doing drills where we, we were just, you know, holding medicine balls and stuff like that. And like, you know, kind of in a squat or doing some mm-hmm. other like, you know, defensive drill where we had to stay low and, you know, play in the post the whole time and you couldn't rise up because the lower you play, the actually the bigger you are because the quicker mm-hmm. you can get up off your feet, you can yes, get to a yeah. stance to trap. So a, mm-hmm. lot, a lot of it came to being in good shape, right? You have mm-hmm. to be in good shape so that when you get, you know, hit in the chest or wherever, you're not, you know, leaning over because you're tired or whatever and getting that quick foul. Yeah. Oh, and, you're, yeah. mm-hmm. and, and you're playing lower so you can get to all these different coverages and you know the lower you are the faster you are and you look bigger which is weird yes but that's, yeah that's a yeah. big key of it yeah and i think i think to your point you like being lower and it, it does make getting off the floor so much easier because I, I feel like one mm-hmm. critique i'll see sometimes is people will say oh you know this big man he's he's kind of like a low leaper in this and that it's like okay well if he, yeah. if he had a little bit bend more bend in his knees in the first place then he wouldn't have to bend down too low up yeah so it is it is kind of like a yeah. whole yeah there is like a weird kind of paradox to that whole thing yeah um one thing that i thought uh was also impressive about your game down the stretch is, is some of the things that have on offense and you had a, a really good shooting year as a whole um and we're gonna get to the shooting because i think that's a, a really enticing thing for a lot of fans and front offices just because there aren't, I feel like the three and D big man is like kind of a, a thing that people like to, to have, but yeah. uh, I want to talk about your offensive rebounding first. So um, really good marks on the offensive glass this year. How did you manage to do that while also being in a position where not, you're not like living on the perimeter, but you are away from the basket quite a bit. So how did you mm-hmm. kind of balance that aggression on the offensive class and, and know when to go for it and when it, you know, maybe best to, to not. Yeah. So, um, at, at Vanderbilt, our, our three, four and five go every time, or at least we're mm-hmm. supposed to. Right. So, so the, the, the way it works is, you know, like, like for, for, you know, people who maybe don't know, like, you know, different markets on the courts. So there's, there's a nail on the free throw line. Right. And so people call that the nail, you know, and they'll use that for different coverages. So like our three are, is supposed to get to that. Right. Cause a lot of rebounds, like statistically will like, if they get shot, they'll end up there mm-hmm. or around the area. And so it's kind of like, you know, they're kind of like a free safety, like roaming, trying to get that. Well, then depending on where the shot was taken, the four and the five are supposed to get to the weak side and kind of pinch because that's the other place that's most likely to um, to land, right? Mm-hmm. And, and it doesn't happen every time. But so when you're sealing your guy under, like 
any post player will tell you this when, when a guy like when you're guarding them and the shot goes up you're, you know, you're getting ready to box out but if they've already you know quickly gotten to the other block and are starting to seal you down it, it's tough to move I mean, you're, you're you're kind of in you're kind of dead if the ball goes yeah. over there you're gonna get it mm-hmm. so i got i got a lot of rebounds off of that but then also understanding that you know they talked about how the ball does you know go to the nail sometimes so like depending on where they shot it you know sometimes it was just kind of intuition like okay i don't think that's gonna you, know, you kind of look at the ball, you can kind of tell the flight path. And so then I'd end up going towards the middle, getting a rebound there. And and, and so I, I kind of collect a lot just, just by kind of listening to what our coaches said and just executing <laughs> game plan. It, it, as simple mm-hmm. as it sounds, it, that's really what it was. Is like they know the game so well. There's all these analytics. Yeah, now, while, yeah. while there is an eye test, but really following mm-hmm. these analytics on, hey, like 70% of the time, it's going to end up in one of these two places. Yep. Yeah. So if you play the percentages, you should fall into two or three. And then from mm-hmm. there, Either you're probably going to have a kick out three, which is statistically the best three pointer in basketball, yes, is, you know, yep. in out three, or you'll probably have because the defense is scrambled, you'll probably either have a one on one or an easy lay, mm-hmm. and you most likely will get fouled because they're not ready. And, and so yep. that that actually tra- uh, kind of helped me live at the line a little bit too. I drew a lot of fouls a game, yeah. So I, I think my offensive rebounding was directly correlated to that, or like, or you know, my free throw percentage was cor- correlated to my offensive rebounding, I should say. So for sure. And I, yeah. And I think like where rebounds go is a pretty like understudied aspect of mm-hmm. basketball too. Like yeah. I, I grew up with a dad who coached and I did not, I did not play at a high level. I'm not very good, but, yeah. <laughs> but when I did play, he, he was yeah. all over that. He was all over mm-hmm. like, Hey, when someone shoots from the corner, like most likely like this percent of the time it's going to go, it's going to go to the weak side of the floor and things like that. And just yeah. like knowing where a ball is likely to be headed is, is something that's really important. And it makes obviously tracking the ball is important, being able to read it and, and see it in real time. But yeah, just knowing statistically where it's more likely to go than not is can really help a lot with, with positioning. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, if you, uh, I don't know if you watched the last dance at all. I mean, I love to watch that. Yeah. I feel like yeah. every basketball junkie watched that during COVID or whatever, mm-hmm. but with the episode on Dennis Rodman, I don't know if you'll remember this, but like he talked about how he'd go to the gym and just have his friends shoot it. He'd watch like the flight of the ball. And I'm mm-hmm. like, okay, this this dude's nuts, like watching the flight. But but there is something to that, right? You can kind of there tell is. by like, like okay, how it's rotating. Like if the ball, like if someone shoots like a knuckleball, you can kind of tell it might just drop and go straight up, or like it might go off to the side. You can kind of, you're not gonna guess right every time, but there is something to that. And I mean, obviously, I, I'm no Dennis Rodman, not saying that, but like you know, I don't think people realize that there is kind of there's a lot of strategy involved in rebounding too. Mm-hmm. And yeah, so and like, there's uh, patterns, and that's and yeah. it's pattern recognition and knowing what you're mm-hmm. looking at. And, yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, so the, so let's let's get to the shooting because it's it's mm-hmm. a big part of of your game. Um, you're obviously yeah, obviously you got to learn a ton this year. You took almost seven free throws a game. You made seventy three percent of them, which people always look at the free throw shooting as an indicator of outside shooting because it's a, a pretty good correlation. Yeah. Um, but you took two threes a game. You made sixty three point five percent of them really good mark mm-hmm. really good volume uh for a yeah. player your size um and you really started to hit those shots down the stretch while taking more of them too um mm-hmm. when did you start to develop as a jump shooter because it felt like back when you were at drake even it was something you started to do and then at minnesota kind of started to, to take off a little bit was that something that you always had or is it just something that you've kind of continuously implemented once you got to the college level yeah, so it was always something I worked on, right? Like, like you know, like, like I said, like I grew up watching, you know, John Lewis, Frank Kaminsky, and all, all these bigs, and you know, like I, you know, I, I was, I wasn't, like I always like pride myself on like you want to work on everything, right? And so when I, when I went to the prep school at Sunrise Christian Academy, I, I was fortunate. Yep. My co- my coaches there never really put me in a box. They'd have me work on threes. They'd have me work on everything else, like I was a guard, right? Like they'd have me work mm-hmm. on ball handling drills and stuff. And, and so the the kind of like the kind of growth of it happened over time. Right. Cause I, when, I, when I went to Drake, the coaches, there were like, you need to learn how to shoot the three, right? Like that's mm-hmm. kind of where the game is going. You need to learn how to do this. Like if you, if you, you know, love basketball and you want to continue to play, you need to learn how to shoot the three buddy. Like, and so, you know, I kind of worked on it there and, and my, my percentages weren't great there. I got to Minnesota. My percentage got a lot better. Um, last year it kind of dwindled a little bit, but then, you know, I really dedicated to this, uh, dedicated to my shot this summer really that was something i really wanted to show i could continuously improve on and still get better past this and uh, i started out cold but uh, sec play i picked it up and you know my percentage showed that i'm I'm making growth there so you know a lot of credit just 
just like it was just a solid progression over time and i i think it's only gonna get better as i continue to work on it and so you mentioned like at sunrise how they kind of let you explore the studio space as far as like doing everything and that's something you hear yeah. a lot more of like overseas and i think a lot of a lot of the schools like like sunrise that have that like really strong track record you're starting to see more of it do you still think that it's something that's like lacking in american basketball is just getting guys like comfortable doing more because i i think it does also help as far as just understanding what everyone on the court is trying to do at the same time yeah. beyond just like your what what your role and your position is yeah i mean so like i i, I was never like i was never small right but like i didn't mm -hmm. think i was gonna be this tall and so i was always kind of stuck in the post a, a little bit right like mm -hmm. growing up and so my my handle like wasn't really there but like i would still work on my shot on my own right like when i'm in the driveway just because i was a hoops junkie so I'd, I'd be working on that but like yeah I, I think i think sometimes coaches get so stuck in that you're this position right mm -hmm. and it, it's not that they're trying to hurt you they're trying to make you the best at that position but basketball is becoming positionless so you kind of, I think the, I, I think you're starting to see it more with younger kids. Cause I like, you know, you work these, you know, you see these kids at these kids camps or on, you know, the AU circuit on Twitter or whatever. I mean, you're, you're seeing more and more guys, my height who are 16, who are shooting 10 threes a game. So I, I, yeah, I think yeah. it's, I, I haven't, I guess I haven't been around it at the, you know, the lower levels recently enough to know, but I mean, even at sunrise, I mean, they're, they're having everyone work on everything. And that's one of the premier prep schools in the country. Right. So like, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think those who know basketball know you need to be able to do everything in order to get yourself playing just even in college, whatever level that might be. Right. Mm -hmm. And then the pros is obviously another step from that. For sure. For sure. And I, I think your, your passing is something where that like kind of well-rounded development shows up as well. Mm -hmm. I think you're, you kind of don't get enough credit there. Um, can you just talk about like how you, how you read the floor and, and how you're able to find guys? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I kind of have a unique, I, I, I kind of think I have a unique angle, right? Because there's not a lot of people who can kind of like what, even if they get up and pressure me, I can still pretty much raise my arms up and throw it over them. Right. And, and so I'm able to kind of bullet passes in more. Like I don't have to bounce pass in. I, I'll still do that. Right. Like that's an important part of the game. Like I've had a lot of coaches work, you know, that's an essential fundamental of the game. Like if you watch Villanova, they, they bounce past the ball around the perimeter, right? Like there's teams yeah. who really use like that. Like now I wouldn't feel comfortable doing that just because I've never been taught to do that. And I'm sure mm -hmm. if I, I worked on it every day, I would. But but I, I think just because of my height and stuff like that and being able to see guys when they're cutting, I, I feel like I'm able to kind of deliver some passes that most people couldn't. You know, that sometimes gets me in trouble though because I'm like, oh, I can definitely get this. But then, you know, I'm throwing it so, so hard sometimes. You know, if a guy deflects it slightly, it might go out of bounds or whatever. But... I, I think that's one area of my game I really want to improve on, right? It's just making more, you know, concise passes. And, and one thing as I've gotten older is I've realized sometimes the simple pass is the best pass. Like, yeah, I could try and fit in this window, but if I just move it one over, this guy's going to have to help, and then they're going to hit the corner, and it's going to be a three, right? Yeah, yeah. The hockey yeah. assist is like an underrated thing, where yeah. it's like sometimes just swinging it is all you need to do. And, yeah. and that'll force the next rotation, and then you're in business. And, and that's one thing I, I think I gained a lot this year was uh, in double teams. Like, you know, throughout my career, I really struggled with double teams in the post. And, and this year, I, I, I really noticed it against – I don't know if I turned it over against a double team. I'm, maybe I did once or twice this year. I'm sure mm -hmm. I did, but, like, just because it's basketball. Yeah. But I remember, you know, they, they were intentionally doubling me. And instead of trying to make some cross-court pass or anything like that, like, I would, I would kind of bait them in. Like I kept dribbling because they were going on like the second or third dribble. And so, so I, I would dribble once. Okay. They're not going I'd you know, take a step in, bump a little bit, take another dribble. And as soon as they went, I would throw it right back to the guard who was sitting right above me on the wing. And we'd, and then, you know, we're coached so well, they would rotate around the corner and everyone could hit the three. Whoever's mm -hmm. in the corner got like two or three wide open threes. And we kind of blew the game open at their place mm -hmm. just by doing that. And I, I felt, like not to pat myself on the back and like that, but that was like, for me, I felt like that was a step of growth, right? Like not that for I sure. did anything great, but it was like, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm making steps in the right direction, just basketball IQ wise. Mm -hmm. So absolutely, th that's where I think my passing has grown the most is just being mature enough to understand the simple pass is the best pass sometimes. In what, so we, I, obviously you've mentioned like this, like passing is something you've been kind of focused on. Are there other areas that are like, this is like the one thing I really want to show that I can, that I can improve at or get better at? Like, is there one element of your game that, whether it's film study or whatever, that you're just like, I'm really kind of keying in on this element of my game right now. 
yeah, I, I would say uh, just, you know, like shooting something I always want to prove, but dribbling the ball, like actually okay. being mobile with the ball. I feel like, cause I feel more than comfortable if you were to have me, you know, dribbling the zooms or like trying to set up, you know, some actions on the top of the key. I have no problem doing that. Right. But like one person, I'll, I'll give him some credit. Uh, I played, you know, Colin Castleton, like, yes. He, great player. He, uh, yeah. Great player. Um, you know, he, he'll take the ball up the court sometimes. Right. And we had our guards kind of pressure him a few times and he, uh, he handled it very well. Like he just, okay, this, you know, did his little move, you know, got some space open and hit the next guy over. And I was really impressed with that. And it's something I think I can do. I just haven't worked on a lot. So I think that's something that, you know, as I start developing and I, I see more and more guys in the NBA do it. Right. So I'm like, I feel like if I can develop that, that'd really bring an extra element to my game to where not only can I set up something, I can get into the action to begin with. Right. Like if, mm-hmm. if like I get a rebound and the guards, you know, clear out, they don't have to come back to the ball. I can just walk it up, get us in an action and we don't have to worry. Right. And yeah. And I think, I think that kind of stuff is like really big for early offensive sets too. And like yeah. early offense is just another area where it's like it's very efficient. If you can get something mm-hmm. going early on in the clock. Yeah. And, and especially with the, you know, like NBA, right. It's a short shot clock. Yep. So you don't have that extra six seconds to get stuff set up. Like you kind of got to go. So like, I feel like as I, as I improve on that, which I'm sure I will just because like, you know, it's something like, in college, you don't really even need to do, but like mm-hmm. you, I still work down a little bit, but I feel like as I work on it more, it's going to be something I'm more comfortable doing. And then, you know, it, it's going to really go from there. But yeah, I just think it'll just be a valuable asset. I can show that I can provide to a team, right? Like, Hey, like I can help us get into our sets quicker. For sure. For sure. Yeah. And, um, last question, one I always kind of like to close on, well, I've got one more after this, but it's not a, a basketball question. <laughs> okay. What what do you see your, your role being on an NBA team as, as we head into the draft process? Uh, you kind of touched on it earlier. I, I'd say like, I, I think I'm a versatile big, but a three and D big, I think is something I could do really well. Like I, I'm, I pride myself on being a very unselfish player. I'll do whatever you ask of me, whether that's, you know, getting rebounds, I'll try, I'll, I'll make sure I'm the best rebounder, you know, whether it's just facilitating the ball, I'll do that. I mean, you, you can look at my year this year at Vanderbilt. I came off the bench mo- most of the season, right? Mm-hmm. Like I was more than happy to do that. And, you know, I did certain things from the bench and then, you know, and then I got, you know, I started starting. I did other things from there. I, I just think I'm someone who y- you could really plug and play wherever you need to. Like if you want me to sit in the corner and shoot threes, like kind of like, you know, the Bucks sometimes do with Brooke Lopez and then yeah. be an anchor on the defensive end. Mm-hmm. Um, I definitely feel like I could do that. Or, you know, if, if you need me to be more like, getting into zoom action and stuff like that. Like uh, I watch uh, uh, Valanchunas and stuff like that. Like how he like, you know, he does a great job using his body as almost a screener when he's handing off and stuff like that and getting guys pinned on the back. Like if you need me to be like that, like I'm a, I have a pretty big frame. Obviously I would say like, to go back to the other question, I, w- I want to work on my screening as well to make sure I'm setting like understanding angles and stuff better. Yeah. But, but I, I just think like defensively, like you won't have to worry about me. I'm going to be very, very solid defensively. And I'm going to be a good rim protector. But then on the offensive end, I'm not, I'm not a liability. If you like, you know, if there's, you know, everyone sees those last second shots and you have to hit someone for a bailout. If you hit me, I'm going to be able to knock down a shot. And then and I just think that's a valuable thing that any team could have is just someone who's, who's capable on offense, but I'll, I'll be very reliable on defense. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's yeah. spot on. Good assessment. Uh, so my last question, just a, a nice, easy one for you. Where can people find you on social media if they want to follow your journey and everything like that heading into the draft? Uh, yeah. Social media, you can find me on Twitter and uh, Instagram. So my Instagram handle is Liam Robbins zero. And then my Twitter handle is Liam Robbins underscore. Perfect. So, yeah. Sounds good. Give him a follow. Liam, we really appreciate you coming on and talking with us. Yeah. It was it was great to pick your brain a little bit, gain your insights, and we're all wishing you the best here as you head into the uh, the NBA draft here in June. Appreciate you having me. Great talking to you. For sure. Thank you guys all for uh, tuning in as well. Make sure you subscribe to us on YouTube and on all of your podcast feeds, wherever you listen to your podcasts, and subscribe to our Substack as well for written work every single day. I'm Maxwell Baumbach. Thanks for joining us.